this can all right myself ready for class we are finishing module one today well the lecture portion we still have the project to do these two parts uh, don't necessarily have a lot of technical stuff, uh, but what they do have is important because you could easily get fired over spending way too much on the cloud because you weren't maintaining uh, the cloud infrastructure and ensuring only what you need is is running and everything else is off. So we begin with something that people tend to get wrong, authentication versus authorization. Authentication is the process of establishing the identity of a person or service that wants to access a resource. It involves the act of, cha of challenging a party for legitimate credentials and provides the basis for creating a security principle for identity and access control. It establishes whether the user is who they say they are. Authorization is the process of establishing what level of access an authenticated person or service has. It specifies what data they're allowed to access and what they can do with it. So in this diagram, the identification card represents credentials that the user has to prove their identity. Once authenticated, authorization defines what kind of applications, resources, and data that a user can access. Azure Active Directory uh, is related to Azure AD with some differences. Believe it or not, my, the, uh, Microsoft introduced Active Directory in Windows 2000. That's how old it is. To give organizations the ability to manage multiple on-premise infrastructure components and systems by using a single identity per user, which greatly helped in large environments. For on-premise environments, Active Directory running on a Windows server provides an identity and access management service that is managed locally by your organization. Azure AD is Microsoft's cloud-based identity and access management service. With it, you can do things like identity accounts uh, and it, that service is global. If you've ever played with Active Directory itself, Azure AD isn't that different. Uh, securing identity on-premise with Active Directory don't necessarily monitor sign-in attempts by Microsoft. So uh, you have to connect the two in order for them to be used together. So Azure AD is great for IT admins app developers, users, and online service subscribers. It'll give you things like authentication uh, for applications and resources. It'll give you the self-service password reset, MFA, uh, any uh, list of banned passwords, smart lockout. It can handle things like single sign-on for everything in your organization. You can do application management and device management. Azure AD helps you secure uh, external and internal resources. So things like Office 365, the Azure portal, and other software as a service, along with your corporate network and intranet and anything that's cloud related and connected to the cloud. Connecting the two 
should be easy enough and that'll provide you that consistent experience and the identity experience for all your users. The most popular is Azure AD Connect. It synchronizes your user identities between on-premise Active Directory and Azure AD. It'll synchronize the changes between both systems. So you can do things like SSO, MFA, and self-service password reset on either end and they'll both sync up. Speaking of MFA or multi-factor authentication, it's that, uh, that method of prompting a user for an additional form of identification. Could be things like a mobile phone or a fingerprint. Uh, with the Microsoft system, you could do something the user knows, like an email or password, something the user has, uh, like a code sent to a, a mobile phone, or something the user is, like biometrics. As you all should know, multi-factor authentication will increase identity security by limiting the impact of credential exposure. With it enabled, an attacker who has the user's password would need to have possession of their phone or their fingerprint or something else, like a YubiKey, in order to uh, fully authenticate. The Azure AD multi-factor authentication service provides that capability. It'll enable users to choose an additional form of authentication during sign-in, like a phone call or a mobile app notification. The free edition uh, is in the global admin level of access. And that will be the Microsoft Authenticator app, the phone call, or a text code. You can enable it for all users in the Microsoft Authenticator app only by enabling security defaults. If you go with the P1 or P2 licenses, the premiums, you can have more comprehensive or granular configuration. And then uh, they have a link for more information on the, the different versions and what, what you can get in them. Uh, do I, uh, uh, for YubiKey, let's see, we have the mobile app, the phone call, SMS. I don't see a key. I think they really want you to use their stuff. Yeah, I don't see any talk about uh, using other things like a physical key. Now that's just a quick cursory look at the link they have. Maybe there's information elsewhere that says they can they can use a YubiKey. I kind of would think it's silly that they that they wouldn't. Um, conditional access is a tool that Azure Active Directory uses to allow or deny access to resources based on identity signals. That could be who the user is, where the user is, what device they're requesting from. It provides a more granular multi-factor authentication experience for users. They may not be challenged for a second authentication factor for example, if they're known, if they are at a known location, but they could be challenged for MFA if they are in a place that we don't expect them to be. A conditional access will collect signals from the user, make decisions based on those signals, and then enforce a decision by allowing or denying 
uh, based on the response. So in this example, the user might be, uh, the signal might be the user's location, device, or application that they're trying to access. Based on these signals, the decision might be to allow full access if the user is signing in from their usual location. If the user is signing in from an unusual location or a location that's marked as high risk, then access might be blocked entirely or granted after the user provides a second form of authentication. Enforcement is the action that carries out the decision, like saying you need another, uh, another way to verify yourself. Again, it's useful to require MFA to act as an application. It's useful, it's required access to services only through approved client applications and requires users to access your application from only managed devices, along with blocking access to any untrusted sources. The conditional access also comes with a what if tool to help you troubleshoot your policies. You can use this tool to model your proposed conditional access policies across recent sign-in attempts from your users to see what the impact would have been if those policies have been enabled. So you can test them. Not only can you set these conditional accesses, but you can run them through basically simulations to see what would happen and how would you react uh, to them and whatnot. Next part is a governance strategy. And if you're like me who enjoys tech stuff, this is like, oh no, we're getting out of my realm. But again, it's something that we need to be aware of. All right. The cloud adoption framework. It consists of tools, documentation and proven practices. It has all these stages of defining the strategy, making the plan, readying the organization, because just because you make a plan doesn't mean it automatically will be accepted by the organization. You have to adopt it and then govern and manage the cloud environment. And just like with everything else in tech, you don't just set and forget you'll have to go back and start the process over again. The govern stages focuses on cloud governance. Um, you will need to define our strategy. Uh, in different stages. For example, uh, to define strategy, you want to define and document your motivations. You want to document your business outcomes. You want to develop a business case, because why should we move to the cloud if we have stuff locally? And choosing the right first projects that will be achievable and show a progress towards cloud migration. After that, you can make your plan, now building the, the inventory of your digital assets. You'll uh, make sure that the right people are involved in this effort, both from a technical standpoint and the uh, cloud governance. You'll build a plan uh, for individuals to build the skills they need to operate the cloud, because as you have seen, it's not necessarily straightforward. I mean, just getting our Azure accounts was, uh, was a trip and a cloud adoption plan to bring together development operations and business teams. Then we hit the ready section, where they call it the landing zone. We set up an Azure guide to help more users be familiar with it. Uh, we 
it, it'll have to get refined to ensure that it meets operations, governance, and security needs. And of course, have the best practices so that the cloud migrations are scalable and maintainable. As you get on that, uh, you'll hit the adopt portion where you'll migrate your first workload, you'll enable those scenarios, you'll uh, Im implement best practices and do any improvements along the way. Because, you know, with anything tech, it doesn't work right out of the box. And I have to make some changes along with innovating as you go to, again, ensure that uh, it meets the customer needs. If that customer is your organization or uh, another organization, implementing those best practices all the way. And of course, checking in with the customer to make sure that you're still building what they need. Then you'll hit that governance section, uh, considering the uh, building a methodology to incrementally take those first steps all the way to full cloud governance, having benchmarks to see where we're at and where we want to go, creating those plans and of course improving it and managing, expanding the baseline as more uh, projects are successful and, and taken up to the cloud, ensuring that we're always running best practices on everything not overwhelming. The subscription governance strategy has three main things. The first and foremost is billing, creating one billing report per subscription so that multiple departments can see what their cost is on the cloud. You can use things like resource tags to help you out as well. You have access control. Uh, these are basically deployment boundaries. Each subscription is associated with an, an Azure AD tenant, and each tenant has an administrator who can set granular access throughout defined roles. Now, so boundaries can be like, do you need separate subscriptions for development and for production? And of course we have subscription limits. Uh, for example, the maximum number of network Azure Express route circuits per subscription is 10. Now those limits would be considered during your design phase. And if you need more, then you would add more subscriptions to it. Of course, there's gonna be some hard limits and there'll be no flexibility to increase those. The way that a role-based access control is applied to resources, kind of shown here. Role-based access control is applied to a scope, which is a resource or a set of resources that the access will apply to. So this can be things like a management group, a single subscription, a resource group, or a single resource. Observers, user managing resources, admins, and automated processes illustrate the kinds of users or accounts that would be typically assigned to various roles. Anybody who's assigned the owner has full rights and can manage everything in a subscription or within the group. Anybody with a reader can view. Anybody with contributor can manage, but uh, can only manage that group that they're in. This role-based access control is useful when you need to allow one user to manage VMs in a subscription and another user to manage virtual networks, you know, separation of duties, allowing a database admin to manage SQL database in a subscription, allow a user to manage all resources in a resource group, such as virtual machines, websites, subnets, 
allow an application to access all resources in a resource group. Of course, these are just a few examples. You know, you can, you can deploy RBAC in, in many different ways. Again, uh, RBAC is enforced on any action that's initiated against an Azure resource and passes through the resource manager. You can get to that resource manager through things like the Azure portal, the Cloud Shell, PowerShell, and CLI. Any application level security needs to be handled by that application. RBAC uses a allow model. When you're assigned a role, RBAC allows you to perform certain actions, such as read, write, or delete. If one role assignment grants you read permissions to a resource group and a different role assignment grants you write permissions, you will have both read and write to that resource group. RBAC is applicable to individual people or groups. You can also do it to special identity types like service principles or managed identities. Uh, they can be applied to automate access to resources. So like ad, IT admins, backup and disaster recovery folks, cost and billing and security operations. The place to manage them is in the access control pane in the Azure portal it'll tell you who has access to what scope and what roles apply. And from there, you can add or remove as needed. A resource lock prevents resources from being accidentally deleted or changed. With RBAC in place, there is still a risk that people with the right level could delete critical cloud resources, you know, like an insider, an insider threat. Think of a resource lock as a warning system that reminds you that a resource should not be deleted or changed. These are manageable through the Azure portal under settings uh, of any resource pane and you'll see there the lock. The two uh, things that you'll see are cannot delete, which means authorized people can still read and modify, but they can't delete without first removing the lock and read only. Only authorized people can read a resource, but they can't delete or change the resource. This is similar to the reader role in RBAC. If you need to modify a locked resource, you'll have to first remove that lock. Uh, it'll ask you for an additional step, but it, you know, it helps uh, protect your admins from doing something they may not intend to do. Resource locks apply regardless of RBAC permissions. Even if the owner is trying to access a resource, they must remove the lock before they can perform the blocked activity. Which is good. We add those, those controls to ensure that uh, nobody accidentally does something they shouldn't. As you use the, the Azure Cloud more and more, you're going to need to use tags to help you stay organized. You can place resources in their own subscriptions. Uh, you, can, you can put uh, resource groups to manage related resources. You can also use resource tags. Uh, they can provide metadata about your resources, like resource management cost management and optimization, operations management, security, governance and regulatory compliance, and workload optimization and automation. You can add these tags through the PowerShell, CLI, the resource manager, REST API, or the Azure portal itself. 
uh, you can manage the tags in the Azure policy. And you can use that to enforce tagging rules and conventions as well. You don't need uh, to enforce tags on all your resources. It's just another way to help you stay organized in the cloud. The Azure policy will help you uh, stay compliant after you've built up your governance and your business requirements. It enables you to define both individual and group of policies. They're called the initiatives. Uh, it will evaluate your resources and highlight any that are not compliant with the policies you've created. It already has some built in and of course, you can add more into things like storage, networking, compute, security center, monitoring. It's a three-step process. You have to define the, uh, the policy, like uh, defining virtual machines, locations, MFA, that kind of stuff. You'll define uh, the resource or you'll assign the definition to those resources and review the result. So once those are created, it's pretty straightforward. Azure Blueprints orchestrate the development, the deployment of various resource templates, such as the role assignments, the policy assignments, the resource manager and groups. When you form a cloud center of excellence or a team or a cloud custodian team, uh, that team can use the Azure Blueprints to scale governance practices through the organization. It's a three-step process to create the blueprint, assign it, and track blueprint assignments. With these blueprints, the relationship between the blueprint definition, or what should be deployed, and the blueprint assignment, what was deployed, will be preserved. So in other words, Azure will create a record that associates a resource with the blueprint that defines it. That'll help you track and audit your deployments. Each component in a blueprint definition is known as an artifact. They don't have, uh, or they don't need to have any parameters like uh, deploy threat detection on SQL server doesn't really have any further configuration. Artifacts can contain one or more parameters. Uh, this one here shown is the allowed locations policy. And it has a parameter that specifies allowed locations. You can specify parameters value when you create the blueprint definition or when you assign a blueprint definition to a scope. This way you can, maintain, you can maintain one standard blueprint, but still have the flexibility to specify relevant parameters at each scope where that definition is assigned. Something like this, when trying to make uh, a blueprint to be ISO 27001, compliant. All right. One more uh, part to complete part number five, or no, actually they call it modules, sorry. So speaking of being compliant, 
here is some of the more popular compliance offerings that are already available on Azure. They're grouped by global, US government, industry, and regional. Now they say they have a longer list than this, but at least it shows you some of the stuff that they are already uh, compatible with and can help you become compatible when you upload or start creating stuff in the cloud. For example, the Criminal Justice Information Service, the Cloud Security Alliance STAR certification, the European Union model, HIPAA, or Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, uh, the ISO IEC 27018, uh, a, a multi clear, multi tier cloud security for Singapore, uh, Service Organization Controls 123, the National Institute Standards of Technology and even the UK government G cloud. All of these are available to help you be compliant to them when you start uh, uploading to the cloud. The Microsoft privacy statement explains what personal data Microsoft collects, how Microsoft uses it, and for what purposes. As normal end users, we tend to ignore this. We tend to not look at it. We tend to just click yes and move on. For business, we need to know what, what they're doing. So this privacy statement covers all of Microsoft services, websites, apps, software, service, and devices. Again, for a business, I highly suggest reading through it because we definitely don't as end users. They have an online services terms for subscriptions like Azure, Dynamics 365, Office 365, and Bing Maps. They have a data protection addendum that further defines data processing and security terms for online services, like the compliance with laws, disclosure of process data, data security, and data transfer, retention, and deletion. You can access this by searching for DPA as shown in the picture under the licensing terms and documentation site. Again, you need to be familiar with these, these documents as uh, an organization. Uh, they have something called the Trust Center that showcases Microsoft principles for maintaining data integrity in the cloud and how Microsoft implements and supports security, privacy, compliance, and transparency. This site will give you an in-depth information about the, those items along with additional resources. You are able to take a look in the, the Trust Center and locate things like compliance offerings and see a list of what they have. And you can review documentation like the overview of the standard, what cloud services are within scope, the, the overview of the audit cycle and links to audit reports, answers to the FAQ, uh, and additional resources and white papers. Again, I'm going to stress, you should be familiar with things like their trust center and familiar with the links that they provide, because as an organization, you're going to need to know not only what's in there, but be able to access them should you need to speak with an attorney uh, because of a breach or just an audit. Uh, you need to be familiar with these things. They have a compliance documentation that'll give you detailed information about legal and regulatory standard and compliance. That's grouped uh, global, US government, finance, health, media manufacturing, and regional. 
in this example, they're uh, going to the compliance documentation under finance, they'll select PCI DSS, which is uh, something that in, in any organization that deals with credit cards has to be compliant with. There you'll see things like the overview of the standard, how it applies to Microsoft, what cloud services are in scope, the audit cycle, and any other research. You can look for the audit reports and you'll find a section for PCI DSS. So you'll see things like uh, the attestation of compliance reports, the shared responsibility matrix. In compliance blueprints, you'll find those blueprints uh, policy definitions for them for like PCI DSS. So you can use all of these to ensure that if your business is gonna, you know, is, has to be compliant with PCI DSS, you have the places to see how Azure meets that compliance. Azure government is a separate instance of Azure service. This is for all uh, government, like federal agencies. Uh, it provides physical isolation from non-US government deployments and provides screened US personnel. This meets all of the regulations and requirements uh, for the, at the federal level, like the NIST 800.171, uh, the Department of Defense, the Internal Revenue Service, and so on. So if you're working in government, you know, you'll, they already have a completely isolated section for the US government. They also have the similar thing for China as well to meet compliance with them. Any questions on part five? I see a no. Okie dokie. We have two sections left and then I'll explain the, um, the last section that will complete this module. Because after that, holy moly, we're going to be a quarter of the way down with the course. Isn't that crazy? Time is flying. Okay. Total cost of ownership can help you compare the cost of running in, the data, in a data center versus running on Azure. The TZO calculator helps you estimate the cost savings of operating your solution on Azure over time instead of on-premise. The total cost of ownership term comes from finance. We're, act, we're borrowing that term because it'll help uh, make the case for the C-suites. With their TCO calculator, you'll enter details of your on-premise workload then you review the suggested industry average cost, which is adjustable for related operational costs, including electricity, network maintenance, and IT labor. It'll provide you with a side-by-side -side report that you can use to compare the costs. And here is just one example of those costs. You actually don't need an Azure subscription to use it. So the way that it works is you define your workload, things like servers, including the operating system, virtualization, CPU cores, memory, uh, any databases, uh, database types, server hardware, and the Azure service you want to use, along with the 
expected maximum concurrent user sign-ins, storage, any typing capacity, including backup and archive, and networking, of course, like the network bandwidth that you would consume in your on-premise. Then you would adjust your assumptions. Uh, you specify whether your current on-premise licenses are enrolled to see would you be saving money. Uh, you also specify whether you need to replicate your storage in a different Azure region for redundancy. You can see the key operating cost assumptions based on several different areas. For example, the electricity per kilowatt hour, the hourly pay for IT admin and network maintenance. So again, you can make those adjustments so they match the cost of your current on-premise infrastructure. And then you'll be able to view the report that'll show a time frame between one and five years, how much would be spent to stay on premises versus going to the cloud. In each category, it will have a breakdown. And you can download, share, and save this report for later view. This is the stuff that you need to have handy when talking to managers in C-suite level, because all this stuff will make sense to them. Purchasing Azure subscriptions you know, they have free and paid subscriptions that fit your needs. And those subscriptions can be things like virtual machines, storage databases, like we've talked about. These are the ones that impact your bill. You have the free trial, which will give you 12 months uh, or a credit to explore any service for 30 days. You have the pay as you go attaching a credit or debit card to the account. Uh, organizations can apply for volume discounts and prepaid invoicing and member offers as well. So for example, anybody with uh, Visual Studio subscribers, Microsoft Partner, Microsoft for Startups, or Imagine. The three main ways to purchase services on Azure are through an enterprise agreement, which are uh, usually for larger customers and is paid annually with a service fee. Uh, you can do directly from the web or through a cloud solution provider. You can bring up or provision Azure resources from the portal or the command line. The portal arranges the products and services by the category and you fix you get the services that'll fit your needs. Uh, this is definitely more aligned with the pay for what you use model. The factors that affect your cost are the resource type, a uh, storage account with like block bob, block blob, or table storage, a, a performance tier or access tier will have different costs to them. Uh, the usage meter, will show you as, as you uh, go with go about with that resource. Kind of like an electricity or water uh, meter in your home. For example, in a VM, things that uh, would be relevant to building would be like the overall CPU time, the time spent with a public IP address, incoming and outgoing network traffic, and this size and amount of disk read and write operations. There's the resource usage. Now you can delete or deallocate a VM. Uh, deallocating a VM means the VM is no longer running, but associated hard disks and data are still kept. The VM isn't assigned a CPU or a network in the data center, so it doesn't generate the costs associated with those.
but it will bill for the data. Deallocating a VM is useful when you don't plan on using a VM for some time to minimize costs. There are different types of subscriptions that you could use. There's also uh, the marketplace where you could get things from third party. When it comes to network traffic, uh, the location can matter as well. You, since you can deploy around the world, uh, different regions have different associated prices. Since uh, geographic regions can impact where your network traffic flows, that is a cost to consider as well. You also have things like billing zones. Because bandwidth is the, the data that's moving in and out, the amount of data that's moving in and out. You have uh, four main zones, zone one, two, three, and the DE zone. So for example, uh, zone one is Australia Central, West US, East US, Canada West, West Europe, France Central and others. Zone two is Australia East, Japan West, Central India, uh, South Korea. Zone three would be Brazil, South Africa, uh, UAE, UAE North. DE zone would be Germany. You can see the estimate cost for your services. That is always available for you to see. You can use the pricing calculator as well. And again, it'll vary depending on what, what it is you're looking at from the region, the tier, the options, a support. All of these things matter. So we have to manage and minimize the total cost. Just because we use the TCO calculator to show how little we're gonna spend, doesn't mean that's exactly what we're gonna spend. We have to make sure that we are prudent with our usage of the cloud. Um, as always, you should carefully consider the products, services, and resources that you'll need. Ideally, you want your provision resources to match your actual usage. The Azure Advisor will tell you what's unused or underutilized, along with recommendations to make to improve your, uh, your workload. You can enforce spending limits so that it doesn't go over a certain quota. You could do uh, reservations to prepay as well. So that, you know, if it, if it goes at a certain point, then, then it'll stop because we had, we prepaid. You could choose low cost locations and regions. You could also use the Azure cost management and billing to control spending. And you'll get things like reporting, data enrichment, budgets, alerting, and recommendations. Uh, you can apply these. Uh, you can apply these as tags. So when, when a certain department is spending too much, you can use that tag to help raise that flag and again, help minimize underutilized virtual machines or do things like deallocate them, delete any unused resources, migrate things from an infrastructure as a service to platform as a service. Um, other ways could be like saving license costs, uh, choosing the right OS, because uh, Linux will always be cheaper than Windows, and other ways to uh, keep the cost down.
Okay, so now we enter the last section, which will be the service level agreements. Again, things that we tend to, as end users, just swipe on through. Uh, but as managing organizations, we need to be aware of. So the service level agreement is a formal agreement between a service company and the customer. It defines the performance standards that Microsoft will commit to their customers. So it really defines what guarantees you can expect from Microsoft. To access these, uh, they are all organized by category. For example, uh, for, to get the MySQL, you would open the service level agreements, you would go to database and then after database for MySQL. In a typical SLA, you'll have the introduction, the general terms and the details. For example, uh, the performance commitment will be measured in percentage. It could be measured in things like the three nines, which is 99.9%, .9%, or the four nines, 99.99%. This is all focusing on the uptime or the percentage of time that a product or service is successfully operational. Some SLAs will have other factors like latency. The Azure database for MySQL guarantees 99.99% or the four nines uptime. This means that the service is guaranteed to be running and available to process requests 99.99% uh, .99 of the time. Another way to look at that would be this. If it's a service with a four nine, with the four nines like MySQL, Microsoft is saying it's going to be down in a week. It'll be down 1.01 minutes. In a month, it'll be down 4.32 minutes. In a year, it's expected to be down up to 52.56 minutes. So again, you want to, to know your service level agreement for what you're using, because there is gonna be some downtime. The question is, what are you able to tolerate as a downtime? Do you need five nines? Do you need a service that is up, uh, you know, uh, sorry, service that is down for five minutes every year? Or are you okay with having a service that will be down three days out of the year? If you have a claim based off of this, you can get service credit. The service credit is percentage of the fees you paid that are credited back to you according to the claim approval process. Uh, for example, with MySQL, if it's 99.99, uh, then you'd get 10 service credits. If it was 99, you'd get 25. If it's 95, you'd get 100. Any free service does not typically come with an SLA. You will have to look at the Azure status to see when something has an outage. And in order to get that service credit that I just mentioned, you'll need to file a claim with Microsoft to receive it. An application SLA 
will define the requirements for that application that you build on Azure. Things that you'll need to consider when building yours are like the business impact. If something goes down, like let's say a special order, what is going to be the impact? Uh, you know, like customers won't be able to place orders. Uh, they'll need to try again later. What is the effect on other business operations? Just because one thing goes down, does, what, what else will that affect? What will the downtime be for other, uh, other things of the business that rely on it? You have your usage patterns that define when and how users will access your application. And of course you define with your team what, uh, what will be in the SLA. Will it be that we are up 99% of the time? Uh, so two nines, three nines, four nines, or five. Well, whatever you decide, you'll need to make your application, your software, uh, your infrastructure to meet that SLA need. You know what Microsoft is saying, you need to use that as the starting point for your own SLA. So a workload is a distinct capability or task that is logically separated from other tasks in terms of business logic and data storage. Each workload defines a set of requirements for availability, scalability, data consistency, and disaster recovery. For example, on Azure, the special orders application here has two VMs, a SQL database, and a load balancer. In order to figure out their, their SLA and see, the, see how it works, they know that uh, the virtual machines have a 3.9 SLA. We know that SQL has four and load balancer also has four. So then you can use some math uh, to multiply them together and find out that uh, the SLA or uh, the uptime of all these together would be 99.78. It doesn't meet 99.9% SLA, so uh, the team would have to go back to figure out is, is this okay? But what do we need to improve? Uh, things to improve could be things like uh, what disks we're using or what tiers we're using in our, in the infrastructure that we're building in and to meet the SLA. Uh, redundancy plays a part in SLA as well. And a reminder that a 99.99, the four nines, is a very difficult thing to achieve. Again, that's one minute of downtime per week. So uh, for that, you really want to build applications or infrastructure that self-diagnosis and self heals during an outage. Four nines means one minute of downtime. I don't know of anybody who could solve an issue in a minute without using some form of automation. Um, service life cycle. These uh, can affect the SLA. So the service life, so life cycle defines how every service is released for public use. Every Azure service starts in development phase where the Azure team collects and defines requirements and builds the service. Once they're tested, they're released to all customers as generally available. Each Azure preview, if you want to use them, have their own terms and conditions. Uh, some of them aren't covered by customer support. So if you want to build something experimental, 
uh, you know, just know that you might not have any customer support. You can preview these under the Azure portal, you'll create a resource and enter the preview, enter preview in the search box and you'll see them. When you do, uh, you'll see preview shown uh, to remind you that you're working with preview versions that may or may not work. You'll be able to provide feedback to the Azure team by using these uh, these beta. And then uh, you can follow through Azure updates to see what, what is still in development, what's available, uh, or you know, uh, follow them as they announce this kind of stuff. Hey, look at that. We have completed module one, the lecture portion. Any questions? Okay, so I'm going to stop.